Paul Rand is a very well-known designer. He designed the IBM logo, and uh, he's a very bombastic personality, and he claims that everything is designed. Everything, with exclamation marks. And in a sense, uh, in, in this human world that we live in, that is true. You know, in this library, it was designed by an architect. You're all sitting on chairs. They were probably designed by an industrial designer. And the logo on your T-shirt, which you pay 10 times more than it would, it were a plain T-shirt, was designed by a graphic designer like myself. And um, in the many years I've been a designer, uh, I felt that every time I came with a design, something I created, was essentially also destroying something else. So, sorry all designers out there, we are actually complicit in destroying the, the world that we live in, okay? So, uh, as mentioned, uh, I've taken a look at deep ecologies and uh, biophysical economics for s solutions, maybe for inspiration, for ideas. Can we change the way we design? Can we design different things such that uh, either we mitigate the destruction that we uh, cause or actually not to destroy anything at all. And this uh, presentation, just some of my explorations. And I think, how do we preserve nature? Um, well, first of all, what is nature? If you don't believe me, nature is actually something that we design. Because the way we see nature is a human construct. Okay? So if you turn on a TV and you watch a movie, so, and you see a lion chasing after a human being, and you think nature is evil. And you get this definition of nature being something that's bad for human beings. But you turn around every week and you see Canadians driving their cars up to the, the, the woods to the cottage. Then nature becomes a refuge. So the very sort of same nature takes on many faces. In Hong Kong, where I lived for a long time, nature is quite rare. So nature is a novelty. So depending on where you live, the way you see nature is quite different also. But all these are very human ways of seeing, seeing nature. It's, it's our way of defining nature. And because of this definition we give nature, we tend to use that as a um, benchmark of how we would interact with nature. Uh, when I came out of Canada a few years ago, that is really, for me, is a novel experience. So every breakfast, you know, I'll be having my cereal, and I look at the window, and there's this cardinal, and he stared back at me. So I give him a peanut. And every morning he came back and he stared at me and I gave him a peanut. So that was nature, my neighbor. But, and I called, oh sorry, I called him Mr. C. He brought his wife along, I called her Mr. C. <laughs> um, but these are names that I gave him. I never really asked him what his name was, that he liked being called Mr. C. And I never really asked him to like peanuts. But I still keep giving him peanuts and he keeps eating it, so I guess he, he likes it. So nature is very different depending on who defines it. But whoever defines it, it tends to be a human who defines it, whether it's a politician or a philosopher or a scientist or an activist, someone like you or a designer like me. <clears throat> Essentially, is a very anthropocentric view of nature, as nature is defined by human beings. Okay? So perhaps you could go back and think, what is your definition of nature, and how, because of those definitions, that you interact with nature. And one of the predominant forces that have shaped the way we see nature in this day and age, especially in the last 200 years or so, is this economic ism called capitalism. So I'm sure the economists here will know what that is. <clears throat> and essentially, um, economists, capitalism is concerned with economic efficiencies as to how prices <clears throat> can dictate the behavior of human beings. So we have this pricing mechanism, how many dollars, how many cents. And because of how many dollars, how many cents, will you buy or will you not buy it? And anything that they can't price within this sort of uh, system, they consider an externality. So something like something in nature, very long ago, the economists who came with this idea of capitalism, they couldn't price it. They didn't know how to put a price tag on oxygen, on water, on trees. So because they couldn't price it, they just felt that let's just not consider it at all. And they called that an externality. But the weird thing about this externality is that 
we tend to take a lot of it in to the economic, uh, into our economic systems, okay? So what, even though we call it an externality, we keep bringing stuff in, and sadly, next one, we keep throwing stuff out also, back into nature. So what is, happens inside the system is a human system. Happens outside, we don't really care. And, well, that puts us in the predicament that we're in right now. How would we solve that? And that's been something I've been giving a lot of thought. And I think the first one I would, first step I'm doing right now is, next. can we redefine nature? So I think people have tried, there are philosophers calling for a new nature, there are philosophers calling for an artificial nature, since nature is a construct anyway, since it's something that us as human beings made anyway, so why not just give them some names and can we build it in those terms? Um, my contention is that those are still anthropocentric views, those are still uh, human-centered views of nature. So I was thinking, can we actually ask the plant? You know, this question came, I couldn't talk to Mr. C, you know, whether he liked peanuts or not, but we can actually think about talking about plants. And I'm not talking about you know, being sort of crazy and playing Mozart to, you know, so your plants grow better, because there is this science called plant communications and signaling. And scientists have actually noticed that plants are very talkative. It's just that we, when we look at a plant, it doesn't, they don't seem to move a lot. We assume that they're silent. But actually they're not, they're very noisy. It's just that they communicate in channels that us as human beings have no idea what's going on. So if we look at the last quotation, they communicate using chemical electrical and acoustic signals. So some examples, uh, this researcher down in uh, the University of Western Australia, and uh, she's very well known in, in that field. Her name is Monica Gagliano. So she did this experiment with the pea plants. So in a drought, the pea plant would uh, give off some chemicals to warn other pea plants in the area that a drought is coming. So the pea plants would take preemptive action they will start protecting themselves on receiving this signal. So you, this is an example of plants talking with plants. And this is not me um, BSing here. This is, if you, you know, is a researcher in the University of Western Australia, if anyone is BSing, it might be her. <coughs> there is another researcher from the University of California, um, Richard, I forget his last name. And plants apparently can recognize their own kin. Okay, so in the same plot of land, they could recognize the genetic makeup of the neighboring plants and they determine by the genetic makeup how close they are in terms of, you know, of uh, being familial. And they would actually send out signals in, to each other and try to chase other plants out. So there's this competition between plants in, well, plant tribes, all right? If you want to put a human term to it. Um, there's this example of a plant that gives off chemicals. So when, um, when this plant is attacked by insects, it sets off ke chemicals which attract other insects to come and attack these insects. So th that is sort of saying that plants can actually communicate with non-plant species, maybe with us. So there is this potential there that we can actually begin talking with plants. I'm oh, sorry, this is a good one. <laughs> So this is from the University of Missouri. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think meat lovers can get back at <laughs> <clears throat> So I call these talking plants political plant, you know, because if they can talk, if somehow we can set up a communication channels with them, then they might become involved in our politics and help us shape how we see them or they how, tell us how they see us and we might have to adapt to that. And taking those ideas that the plant researchers have come up with, this idea of a uh, prototype, an idea, what we call design futuring, where we design for a future. So I was thinking of a device, 
they could sort of detect the electrical signals, okay, and maybe show up as a color. So this color circle on the left is a hypothetical electrical signal. The chemical signals, we can use uh, mass spectrometers. Uh, it's sort of like the CI, CSI thing when they put something in and they've got these little curves to tell you what kind of chemicals are in that, that thing. Ah, CSI. But we can sort of display that on a radio chart. Sorry, I'm a graphic designer. This is all I can explain. <laughs> and the acoustic signals, we can actually amplify them. And if you look at the research called cymatic research where signals are converted into waveforms, visual waveforms. So that's that fast circle over there. So the three sort of key ways the plants are communicating, can we detect them and visualize them in some way? Okay? And I'm proposing that we sort of put them together like a plant would, because uh, it's supposed to exist. Because one of the researchers said plants actually have a syntax. They use the same chemical or signaling structure for the same phenomenon. So I'm assuming, I've spoken with some of them, but they wouldn't reply to my emails. <laughs> so I asked this question, you know, do plants have a language? And maybe it's a bit too early, you know, they don't know yet. But nonetheless, I'm proposing, I'm supposing they do. And this would be a plant word. And we might string them together and form plant sentences. So if we understand what plants are saying, we can actually have a device that we can communicate and sort of type in these uh, emblems and it will release those chemicals and the plants will understand what we are saying. So what's happening right now is that in hearing what plants have to say, um, we might then have to really redefine how we see nature. Um, we can no longer assume that they're silent, that they are passively uh, taking on our definitions. And um, it'd be interesting to see what plants would say. Then I think the next question is, would we listen? So um, I'm, in, I'm involving myself in a lot of these types of projects, this kind of this design futuring projects right now. So if anyone is interested in speaking with me, uh, you can ask uh, Pam or this is my email. So this is my presentation. Thank you.